Hello, my name is Jen Mikowski, and my favorite thing is S.E. Hinton. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things without using an algorithm. I am very excited tonight. Jim Mikulski is back and she is the reason I have authors on this podcast. She changed the whole trajectory of finding favorites. And I'm thrilled that you're back. Jen, how are you doing? Great. I'm so thrilled to be back as well. I've been waiting for weeks to do this. I'm so excited. <laughs> and you're back because you have another book coming out. I do. I, the yes. Company of Strangers. It'll be out January 10th with Braddock Avenue Books, and it's a collection of, of short fiction. So the short fiction, is it is it all COVID-era writing, or is, no, is it like span of, your career? It's, it's a mix. I mean, I actually, I um, moved to Southern California three years ago, which mm -hmm. spans the time I was lost on your podcast, but some of yeah. the... A few of the short stories in this collection were written here. Most of them were written in Baltimore, though. Still in Baltimore, yeah. Um, but the cover is really great. I, I have um, it's a cover of like a some surfers looking at a standing in front of a California sunset, and it was so weird. Like we live, I guess about um, it's like a ten minute drive from the beach, and we were coming home from the grocery store, and we were at, at a traffic light. And I just looked over, and these surfers were sitting there, kind of chatting. And there was this beautiful sunset behind them. And I just took the picture from the car, you know. Wow. And it turned out so good that it, it, I, was, I just wanted it to be the book cover, even though, like, not all the, the stories were set in this area. I just felt like, because yeah. they were all just kind of standing in their own, like, little thoughts. And they weren't exactly talking to each other. And they were all holding their boards. And it kind of reminded me of, like, a lot of the stories, how we just, people that we know are strangers, but then we, we have also have these intimate connections with people we don't know. And it's... Mm -hmm. You know, it, our whole life is just sort of not really quite knowing what another person is thinking. Yeah. So when when did this book become like a sparkle in your eye? Well, it, it, like short story collections, they, they take a long time to build because you just have to collect so many stories. And I think mm -hmm. I started to play around uh, with the collection even before I left Baltimore and I uh, there were different titles and it just never felt quite cohesive so you, you just sort of put it aside I actually wrote a novel while we were here um, in Carlsbad during COVID and I'm still like finalizing like the, the draft mm -hmm. of that to, to start sending out but um, I did finally write a, a like the last story in the, this collection is a novella and uh, I wrote it here and it just felt like the right piece for this collection. And then, mm -hmm. then the, the, you know, the title came from a title of one of the stories in the collection. And it just, I don't know, there's something you finally know when you have the right combination of stories. Mm -hmm. But it, it does take several years to, to come about. So yeah, um, a lot of this is pre-COVID. But I, I was, you know, very active during COVID because we just didn't go anywhere for two years. And we had just moved here, so we had no... Even no like know. bubble, we had we had no right. like friend bubble either. So we were just, it was just sort of me and my partner and our dog, and the perfect time to have your own like you know writing residency, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it's definitely changed. You know, a lot of how marketing has been. Still, everything's kind of online, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't have as many. Uh, I have yet to build like it took you know like ten or twelve years to build the connections I had in the writing community in Baltimore and. It's coming about even slower here because things are still <clears throat> not quite back to normal. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think every industry has been changed by it. And it's just something you have to, you know, go with the flow. And that's, you know, that's life. Yeah, I think we've seen it significantly from, uh, I mean, I'm I, my day job is marketing and financial services. Mm -hmm. And very few of our teams are back to in-person conferences. It's still a lot of webinars. A lot of the meetings that used to be required to be in person are all on Zoom. You know, people aren't getting on planes anymore like they used to. Um, so I see it in work. I see it at my synagogue. 
um, just where we've had people who have, who, and I understand, haven't felt comfortable to come back in person or liked the balance that attending online events brought to their life without the commute in the city. Because of Chicago, the effort to get somewhere in Chicago sometimes can be, you know, 30 to 60 minutes mm. to get somewhere in the city. So it's yeah. it's been... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I just have seen people clinging, and this, and now that it's cold, and you know the sunset today at four nineteen. People mm-hmm. are the people ran outside during the summer, and now they're coming back to online events. Yeah, it's it's a strange thing though. My I joined a book a library book group here in Carlsbad when we moved here. Mm-hmm. And um, we've been online the whole time, and we actually met the other night, and I was like, is, any, is anyone interested in just not doing a meeting in person, but just meeting in person? Because I actually have never met any of you yeah. outside of these little squares, and um, you probably live like 10 minutes away. And everyone was sort of, some people were like, yeah, and some people were like, yeah. And it was like, you know, I know that attendance of the book club is like skyrocketed because people can just get on their, their computer yeah. and in their pajamas and they don't have to, and it's, you know, it can be a pain in the butt after work, make sure you're still dressed or take a shower or comb mm-hmm. your hair and go out to talk about, a, you know, a book that you may have not have finished reading even for right. an hour. So I, I get it, but um, it just felt so weird, you know, and I know like people younger than us, their whole lives have been brought up this way. It's really mm-hmm. just us old, old. So we're just like, Oh my God, now everything's, I mean, I know we've been sort of you yeah. know, pre- preparing for it with, with, social media but um i just think about the old days like when when your bowling league was social media right you'd go out right once a week and that's how you'd get information and gossip and connection right yeah i've talked to friends about a a friend of mine who's in her parent her dad has passed away but when her dad was alive he was the one that was would take her mom and like they would go to the bar in small town Wisconsin, because that is where they saw their people, they caught up with people, and how much her mom's social life has suffered, um, mm-hmm. because she was never the one who had to, like, take the initiative to go to the bar, because her husband would come home and say, like, all right, now let's go, and let's mm-hmm. go here, let's go there, and how hard that can be to maintain. Yeah, I love that story, though. That's great. You really have to think about is this activity outside my home worth the risk worth right. the healthcare risk are the benefits I'm going to get for it for the, the like social benefits, which I think are significant. I think the benefits of seeing people in person are significant. And are those, is that more important or how do I balance that with the risk to my physical health? And it's, I, it's just, I wish I could time travel 50 years and see the research about what this time did for us. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. Well, hopefully we're still alive in 20 more and we'll have some inkling. Yeah. Of, of how it's working out. But yeah. yeah. For the launch of your of this collection, are you going to will you have an opportunity to go back to Baltimore and celebrate with your folks in Baltimore or? Or is it going to be mostly online events? How are you thinking about mm. rolling things out? It's mostly online. Last year, I, I went back to Baltimore um, when You'll Be Fine came out. And mm-hmm. I'm not doing it this year. But um, yeah, like I said, I've done a lot of just more uh, interviews and I've written essays and done podcasts and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, it's actually felt really comfortable to me. And this is someone you know used to host a reading series in Baltimore for many years and co-hosted one for years before that. So very accustomed to like being on stage and being with people. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I I just, as I've gotten older, like I, the the energy has gotten less for me to be able to get out and and do that. And maybe, maybe that's why I identified with Essie Hinton's sort of history because she's very reclusive and she never Mm -hmm. like uh, goes out and does any sort of events now. Um, and part of it was, she said, uh, there was an article online about someone was sort of like her um, handler when she was like in Texas to do a book festival or something. She's just like, because basically I get you know, asked the same like 
four questions every time. Mm-hmm. So I can imagine and there's this, and there's this, um, I, yeah, God, I love music. And I, I was listening to, uh, Isles and Miles, the Joni Mitchell live album. Mm-hmm. Cause I just started collecting vinyl a year ago. So I've just been on this like Ooh. vinyl spree and I, I got that and I was listening to it and she's talking about how, you know, weird it is to like play your greatest hits at these concerts because, you know, no one ever, if you're an artist, no one ever says to, you know, Vincent Van Gogh, like paint Starry Night again. I mean, sure, some people will do, but right, you know, it's weird that we're so like bound by like what we've already done. And, and even when you mm-hmm. see bands, like if I'm going to see a band in concert, like I'm going to see like X this month at the Belly Up in Solana Beach, and I don't want to hear like I haven't even listened to their new album yet, but right. I definitely want to hear Los Angeles, and and you know, so I, I just I, I get it as bands. It's you know, you it's wherever the the fan, like whatever entry point the fan has to your, your body of work mm-hmm. as an artist is what's important to them and not your whole career usually. Yeah. There's some, uh, one of the podcasts I listen to is the Jackie and Lori show. It's Jackie Cation and Lori Kilmartin. Um, they're both women in their mid fifties who have been stand up road comics for 30 plus years. And Lori wrote, uh, did monologue jokes for Conan O'Brien um, but they have both been on the road for 30 years and they talk about the business, the business of stand up comedy, how the business of stand up comedy has changed for women over the last 30 years. And they talk a lot about the churn of comedy albums. How, like, for a stand up yeah. comic, it takes you like eight to 10 years to have enough jokes for your first album. Mm, wow. But then the culture in comedy is once you've recorded an album, that's all trash and you can't ever perform it live again. Oh. So by the time it goes on your album, it is the best. It's the best written. It's You've got the timing down. It's the best it could be. But then because people can hear it whenever they want, comics believe like, well, then that's done. I can never perform it again. And it is the opposite of bands. Right. Um, and then they talk about how sometimes... Um, people will try to request their favorite jokes and they're like, well, maybe people do want to hear the jokes they know. And that debate about like, do you want to always hear something new and unknown and surprising? Or sometimes do you want to hear the greatest hits? And I think it's interesting how it's different between mediums, media. Mm -hmm. Although I would love to, I would love to hear a comedian do their old, I mean, I, I just, because there were certain comedy albums I listened to growing up, like Whoopi Goldberg's album. Mm-hmm. And I just remember the characters she did, like Fontaine. And I, I listened to, it's so much I could do the routine, you know, mm-hmm. or like Joan Rivers. And I, I would just, yeah, I, I would actually be disappointed if I didn't get to hear like some of those jokes just because I yeah. grew up with them. But I, I totally, I totally get that. And I totally yeah. get, you know, I remember a period where I went to see a lot of Lloyd Cole concerts and there was mm-hmm. always a guy there who always request Mr. Wrong, Mr. Wrong. And I'm like, what is he just following Lloyd Cole? Like I am, you know, <laughs> and requesting this, this song that I don't even like, but um, yeah, I, I wonder how Lloyd felt about it. Cause he never actually played the song, but. Hmm. So you brought her up. Mm-hmm. So let's get into it. This time, the favorite thing that you want to talk about, or one of your favorites, is the author Essie Henton. Yeah, it's funny because it's like, you know, a no no in writing books is like to make your author or your character an author. And I've already done that in one book. And now I'm going to mm-hmm. talk about authors on the podcast. So, but I was. I didn't know it was a rule. Well, there, yeah, there is sort of an unspoken, like, don't, you know, use writers in your writing because it's just you know, it's, it's kind of gauche or, or whatever, mm-hmm. or, but you know, they also tell you to write about what you know. So right. You know, what can, you can't what can have you do? both. But, <laughs> but yeah, like S.C. Hinton was sort of like my first, I wouldn't say literary author, but she was like my gateway to like writing novels or like having, feeling like an adult novel, adultish novel could appeal mm-hmm. to me. I just remember, I guess it was like 82 or 83 and going to the North Point Library every Saturday with my grandfather. And, and there, I would just go to the YA section. I would read 
everything that was there, like Lois yeah. Duncan and Lois Lowry. And, mm. you know, I read the whole like row of Nancy and Drew books on summer and um, have collected them over the years again. And um, I, I remember picking up this and I'm pretty sure I read the book first before I saw it in 16 magazine. Cause I was a huge, you know, consumer of like teen magazines at that mm-hmm. age as well. 16 I, young and modern yeah. tiger. Event- yeah. yeah. So, um, Bob later. Um, and I just, I, I read the book and I was thinking I, I hadn't, you know, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in, in, in Baltimore and, you know, they, they weren't exactly gre- greasers, but they were, they were definitely a subset of kids that wore jean jackets and smoked mm-hmm. after school and rode their BMX bikes and they were all tough. And, you know, this... The, and the, the book the, yeah. is Outsiders. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there was like, I don't know, there was just this picture of it. And I sent you the picture of the, the cover that, I, mm-hmm. that was in my library to uh, link to the podcast. But it just that cover and those boys looking so tough and you know I, I guess I could just relate to Pony Boy he was thoughtful and, and literate but also sort of an outsider you know and it was def- we were definitely in a neighborhood that was you know blue collar middle class so I, I felt like there was something sort of there was still like a, a glimmer of like a romantic hope that mm-hmm. you could be this thoughtful character in an area that like was always just very coarse you know that the, the for me, it was just getting called a lot of names, a lot of fat names or mm-hmm. butch names or this and that. And for someone who was, you know, overweight and questioning their sexuality in the 80s, it wasn't like something I wanted to deal with. But I felt like I could like, you know, relate to these characters. And I, it's interesting because, well, apparently this, the, the, the book is based on a true story. Like um, S.C. Hinton, when she went to high school, there were... It, in Tulsa, there were there were greasers and socials, and mm-hmm. um, a boy she was friends with who was a greaser like got beaten up while he was walking home from school, and she was upset about it, and she went home and just started writing, and that was wow. her outlet, and and that became like the first or second chapter of the book when um, or when you know they get jumped later in the book, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was it, it was marketed as an adult novel there wasn't like a young adult market like there is today like absolutely I mean, not the, yeah. other market, the, the market is huge middle between middle age middle grade and ya i mean you mm-hmm. could just have your own barnes and noble right yeah um so it wasn't selling but there was this like sub market that it was selling and it was like just to, to um kids because teachers were teaching it in schools and it, i wondered like what made teachers decide to teach it in schools other than the fact maybe there weren't books that really spoke right. to um other you know i don't know if if they read catcher in the rye back then in the 60s but i i mean we did in high school and yeah to, to kill a mockingbird but maybe they just weren't like hadn't become like what they were at that point in 1967 that they were in like the 80s and, and 90s yeah. when we read them but so and that's actually how the movie was made like uh in 1980 the movie version of The Outsiders. In 1980, there was a librarian at um, the Lone Star School in Fresno. And she wrote the director, Francis Ford Coppola, of all people, mm-hmm. on behalf of her uh, seventh and eighth grade students about adapting The Outsiders. It was like 100 kids mm. who co-signed to this letter. And he was so, like, you know, touched. And he's like, you know, I, you know, I have to do this for them. And this is like, you know, Francis Ford Coppola. You know, right. this isn't like some, some starting out you know director or this is a big deal and, and I, yeah. I thought that was so cool that he just was like yeah we got to do this and you know we got to find like all, and a lot of the a lot of the guys who were cast on the outsiders it was like one of their first films it was their springboard for like greater fame and you think about who was cast in the outsiders movie i mean it was it's just like really a who's who yeah of like 80s like like male future like, heart leads yeah, yeah like Matt Dillon and Patrick Swayze, um, Ralph Macchio, Rob Lowe. Mm-hmm. Rob uh, Lowe. Oh, oh my God! Even um, Top Gun, uh, Tom Cruise, mm-hmm. Emilio Estevez. Yeah. Um, it was just it was just huge. All the all the guys that were in it. Um, C. Thomas Howell was that was his um, debut role, and it just um, I was reading 
you know, back then they, they would all stay in the same hotel, but to get them in their roles, like Francis Ford Coppola would give the guys who were playing the socials or the more of the upper like crust. Like the better rooms, right? Yeah, yeah, and they just to sort of cre- try to create, I guess, a sense of resentment or... Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, I'm glad that he sort of did that, that sort of method acting for them. I'll have too. to... I need to... I'll look for the show notes. I think... It was like Rob Lowe. It was either his interview on like Andy Richter's three questions or armchair expert where he talked about because they are like they're high school students for the most part. Some of them kind of knew each other um, from the scene in L.A., from the acting scene. And and the stories from that set are phenomenal of the. Right. Sometimes some camaraderie, some competition, um, and then they just all go on to have these incredible careers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was just, I don't know. I, it's the staying power is, is amazing to me because I got the, even got the idea because it was recently like, on TCM on, on HBO Max is like mm-hmm. you know one of the movies to watch and I was afraid to, to rewatch it because I was like not a lot has aged gracefully from our, right. our youth but uh, yeah. you know I was surprised that it still sort of stood up and it you know it, it took itself seriously it wasn't corny and and I could see like that there was a lot of natural tension and in, in, in the book and Essie Hinton knew how to like write a compelling scene that made you want to find out what happened to these boys and care about them. And, and then there's continued conflict. So it was really a good primer on how to write a novel. And I don't know, I don't think she had much, like, it's not like she went to a writing program or, you know, we were so right. inundated with MFAs and this and that. But I mean, she really was able to find a natural, like, pacing and, and conflict. And it just, it worked so well as I was, uh, I was impressed. And what I thought was funny is that it seemed like the one of the most gut-wrenching or just difficult parts was like figuring out what to like title it. Like I read an article in um, Slate because I never, I just thought she came up with The Outsiders, but she actually had called it a different sunset. That was the original title. Oh. And, that, you know, I don't mind that. <clears throat> but it doesn't say, it doesn't, yeah, I mean, it just off off on the shelf reading the, the spines it yeah. doesn't really jump out at you um but some of the titles that the editors had suggested to her during this process were and they they have some copies if you go to the slate article they have some copies of the letters correspondence between him mm-hmm. and her editors um some of the alternate titles were north of division street which you know that sounds it's very sort of west side story sounding to me mm-hmm. um the long-haired boys very descriptive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the boys in blue jeans and the leather jackets was another one. So at the last minute, you know, she came up with the outsiders and that, and that worked. Yeah. Um, it's hard to imagine it under any of those names. Yeah. I think it would just completely date itself and be irrelevant, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, but yeah, I, I just thought it was, you know, going back to the, going back to the movie, watching that and, and the title, I just felt like, uh, yeah, she was definitely influenced by products of her time too, like Rebel Without a Cause, she probably mm-hmm. grew up watching and West Side Story. Um, and I think about like, yeah, I think about that too in my own writings. I think about like the things that influenced me when I was, you know, 13 or 14 and writing. And, and when I was coming up in that age, you know, like 84, 85, just starting to read more mature uh, works, but also reading Sweet Valley High still because, you know, yeah. everyone likes that saccharine in their life. But I just remember, like, the big authors then were, like, you know, the, the literary brat packs. So it was, like, Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McKinnerney, so Less Than Zero and Bright Light's Big City. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was, I didn't know much about like writing then. And I just sort of took this as gospel and I spent a, a, too many years writing books in like first person and 
and second person and, and just these very bare deadpan observations mm-hmm. thinking that was like good the way yeah the way to write it wasn't yeah. until like getting to college later and like reading more widely um that was able to put that away although i actually just wrote an essay recently that will be out in the cincinnati review because i, I it just stuck with me um reading bright lights big city that young and i was um talking to someone about my collection and they made the observation that like five of the stories like a good third of the book had stories in second person and how that's also sort of a no-no like Hmm. when you're writing um like you just people don't really gravitate to it much but i apparently gravitated to it a lot first person is i I, mm -hmm. it's like the voice is the point of view right Mm -hmm. yeah third person we know from seinfeld is like an omnipotent observer describing everything, right? Yes. Kind of? What is second? I don't remember what second person narration Second is. person is, is like when you you get up in the morning, you don't, or like the first line of Bright Lights, mm. Big City, you, you're not the type of guy who would find yourself in a place like this. Okay. So it's, and I, you know, I, I had wrote like a bunch of stories like that, but I, I had to think on it for a while, other than being influenced by this particular book. Uh, when I was growing up is is that I guess just being like a, a queer writer it was an interesting time in history and coming up you know in the like 2006 and 2007 there wasn't a lot of queer writing and then it suddenly mm-hmm. exploded especially in YA and middle grade and all of a sudden yeah. I'm like 50 years old and I never felt like I, there was any sort of wave to ride like it, mm-hmm. somehow it, it passed me over because by the time it became really like sought after, it was um, it was a little older and out of the the crucial market. I don't know, mm-hmm. but I I still f- felt like the need to write second person to like uh, so people could see my side of the story. I guess mm-hmm. I guess you're so re- used to reading third person and first person and perspectives that aren't your own, and I, yeah. I, for me, it was a way of sort of like easing people into a character that maybe queer. All of a sudden, you can't escape because you're sort of that you are them, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but also, maybe I mean, fe- second person can be so powerful. I, on somewhere behind me on my bookshelf is the book. Um, shoot, it's a book about someone who survives round after round of layoffs at a, a marketing agency. Mm-hmm. in the crash in 2002 um or in 2001 2002 the first the or the tech bubble crash in 99 who knows which crash it was um and i read that book uh and at the time i was nearing the end of my career at my first marketing agency and i was reading the book and i was like it made me really <laughs> envious of everybody in the book like this, the, the protagonist was was surviving the layoffs, mm. and I was feeling envy for the people in the in the book who were losing their jobs, and I was like, "Oh, that's a hint that your my job is not good for me." If mm. reading this book and being put into the space of somebody in a in a in a place where everybody's losing their jobs makes me want to makes me want to quit. I then like took that advice forward. So, so I can see what you're saying that by easing people in with second person and helping them like try on an identity and live in a story as someone who is not themselves. Um, because I had, I mean, I had a reaction so visceral that I resigned and started my own company Wow. from one, no- <laughs> one novel. Please, please put that book. Bu- that novel title in the in the book notes as well, so I can. I will. I know it it's it's like five feet behind me, but I don't want to. <laughs> I'll it's put okay. it in. I, it'll be in the, the notes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So is is your essay coming um, out a, a, about writing in the second? Is it you reflecting on writing in the second person? Yes. And yeah, it was just a lot of the issues we just discussed, and I guess yeah, part of it was just. I guess our springboard was like, you know, sort of those those influences, those inciting incidents mm-hmm. you had as a as a impressionable young person, 
Um, it, it really depends on, yeah, what you're, what, what's around. And, you know, for me, mm-hmm. those particular books were like on the table at B. Dalton. And I remember the Less Than Zero hardback had a cover with like the Elvis Costello trust glasses the, with mm-hmm. the red and uh, blue lenses. And I was mm-hmm. just like taken by that. And I was part of the reason why I got the book. And yeah, so I'm, and, and with, with um, S.E. Hinton probably being a zeitgeist of her time and just what was going on around her. But, you know, they, she didn't always write about uh, greasers and socials, though, or mm-hmm. socials. You know, when I was a child, I thought it meant that I was reading it in the book and it, I thought it was socks, S-O-C-S, but it's socials. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's good to, it was good to see the movie and iron that out. So I, I was one of those kids that like how to, Big, big vocabulary, but had no idea how to no- pronounce the words because uh-huh. I only just read them. And it's still like to this day, sometimes I will, if I'm going to talk and I want to use a big word, I will go to Google and like Google and listen to how it's pronounced just to make mm-hmm. sure because I know I've like mangled so many words in my life just by seeing yeah. them on the page and learning them that way. I feel like um, a lot of college was finding out what words I had been saying wrong in my head <laughs> for my whole life at that point. Absolutely. Yeah, and I had a roommate who pointed out every single one. I was like, thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> That's exhausting. Yeah. But uh, she, yeah, she also wrote uh, a book called Tex, which was about mm-hmm. a, a boy in, and I think also in Tulsa who lives with his brother. There's a real absence of parents in her books. Mm-hmm. I, I've discovered she wrote That Was Then, This Is Now, which um, I think it was the last of the four that she wrote for, for young yeah. people. And that was in maybe 71 or 72, but it, it, there was some drug use of that in that and psychedelics. And, you know, I was a little too young to understand or to like identify or, or it actually scared me a little bit. Yeah. Um, it was sort of like Go Ask Alice, which scared the crap out of me. And it, it did its job until I got to college and tried all mm-hmm. those drugs. But, you know, for a while I was just like definitely afraid of like psychedelics and any sort of drug. Mm-hmm. Um, she also wrote uh, Rumblefish, which was sort of like The Outsiders, also yeah. a, a boy and his brother. His brother, she had this great thing with nicknames, because in Rumblefish, the main character is Ricky, and his brother was the motorcycle boy. And The mm-hmm. Outsiders, you know, Pony Boy, Pony boy Soda yeah. Pop, you know. Um, so there's, there were some great names that she had. Um, Rumblefish was also directed by Francis Ford Coppola, it was a really art house sort of film. I mm-hmm. remember seeing it in the eighties when it came out, and it came. It was in black and white, except for the uh, there are some uh, Siamese fighting fish, betta fish, mm-hmm. in a pet store like late in the movie. And the only thing in color in the whole movie are these split, these fish, which is kind of wild. Hmm. Um, I I think the brother is like colorblind. Um, oh. But I, that I was a lot of. I think I culture. saw Rumble. I know I saw Outsiders. I know I read it, mm-hmm. but I don't think in Rumblefish I was aware of. But I don't think I ever saw it or read it. Well, it's probably one know. of those that'll come out again in like TCM. Like I said, it's a it's a Coppola film, and mm-hmm. it was very artsy. It was it it was it probably it was probably a little more than it needed to be. You know, it was mm-hmm. uh, very high art. Um, but it was you know also these. I think about all the things I was introduced to from other things. Like I, I know that uh, Stan Ridgway of, of Wall of Voodoo did the soundtrack or, or the title song for mm. Rumblefish. So I, you know, kind of got into him I, and, and his music, um, you know, through The Outsiders, I discovered who Robert Frost was and got to read his poems and you know, I, I did buy I did buy a, a betta fish after Rumblefish. Mm-hmm. And we had some in the household for many years. Um, I remember discovering Oscar Wilde through Morrissey. So it's funny just mm-hmm. how that sort of crossover. Either like you'd read read about bands and music and books, or you'd read about author learn about authors through like song lyrics. You know, right? Yeah. Stuff. So was there anything that like just like you were introduced to by like a band or a book when you were growing up that just like you just ran with it and it just became part of your identity or. So I was given for my high school graduation. Um, I had a, one of my close friends in high school was 
the alternative, the Sunday night DJ on the college radio station. And he gave me a copy of The Stranger by Camus for graduation Hmm. of a particular translation. It was like a new modern translation of The Stranger. And I do have, I have gone on to collect translations of The Stranger um, because it's a pretty, it's a globally published book. Um, So I have a few different English translations. Um, One that I bought in Paris, like at Shakes at the Shakespeare Book mm. Company in Paris, I bought a copy of The Stranger, but then I also bought a copy of it in French from a random from like a guy selling books on the banks of the Seine, Seine River mm. in Paris, and I I bought it in, a copy in Argentina. A friend who went home to China bought me a copy of it, so that's kind of wow. a book that I have a long relationship with. Um, so how many copies do you have now? Like seven or eight. Wow. Well, if I, if I see any in my yeah. travels, you know, I'm going to send you. Yes, send you one. please. So. Um, what I still need for all the times I've been to Israel, I haven't bought a copy of it yet in Hebrew. So that is high on my list, oh. but I'm sure there are, I was very confused when my period started because pads in the eighties weren't didn't have like a belt and are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Yeah. yeah. Right. She had the pads with a belt. And so I was very confused where the, like I was very, I was very mentally prepared for the belt and then there wasn't one. So I, Mm. I remember like, just like not being prepared because of what I had read in the book so many times, Mm -hmm. but Judy Bloom actually went back and, she has continuously Updated, revised yeah. the technology in Are You There? God, It's Me, Margaret. Um, to be like what was actually available. Hmm. I'm going to have to do some research on that. Yeah. I just remember that terrifying me, like reading about, like, I was like, what is this happening? And then I think I, you know, got this, the like nine or the, the 311 at like school from like a guy, like a guy, my brother's friend. Paul, because I'm, my mother took me aside one Saturday morning. She's like, I want to talk about something. And I was like, okay, you know, and she's like, mm-hmm. I heard you talking to your brother while, this is so, so dated. I heard you talking to your brother while you're playing Atari this morning. And you told <laughs> him that when you got your period, it's when you peed red blood, as if, as if there's any other color, right? Right. You peed red blood and had a baby. And I was like, first I was like, I don't know. I didn't say that. And I still right. have no recollection of saying that. And then I know she didn't make it up because I just did, it wasn't in my mom's like, you know, she just, I couldn't see her making up something like that. Right. But I, I had, you know, when you're a kid, you just like have these like blackouts, right? Mm-hmm. Or something. Cause you just do not remember things you said. And I, I yeah. was like, I didn't say that, but I probably said all kinds of shit when we were playing Atari. Right. But I, I do not remember cause, um, but yeah. And then my, she sat me down and, and told me how it really worked. And then a week later I got it and I was like, God, she oh, cursed me. She jinxed you. Didn't she? Like it just, yeah. Um, yeah. But that book scared. I know like, you know, but for some, I'm God, I can't imagine growing up in a family where you didn't talk about it at all. And it just, right. and I've heard so many stories of like girls who are just like, I started bleeding one day and I thought I was dying. Right. I mean, can you imagine? I just, yeah. Oh, I, but so I, I'm glad for this, this public service that Judy Bloom has done, but it just scared yeah. me. So it scared the crap out of me when I read it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's because we were probably both precocious and we were reading above our grade level and we were probably reading yeah. things that we should have still been like reading fifth grade, whatever, you know. Yeah. No, books, once but. I started reading, uh, like my sister was a stronger reader earlier than I was. And then I might have told you this story on our last interview. I won a copy of Stuart Little as a prize for something at school, and my twin sister read it first. She read it before me, and I was like, that is the last time you're reading one of my books before me. (laughs) And then uh, from then on, then really until like the start of COVID, I was like a reader. And then COVID broke my brain. So, um, Does your sister collect any books? Like, um. She reads a ton still. She reads a lot on the Libby app now. Mm-hmm. Great, great. I love that. I did get her a copy of 
they did like a 50th anniversary release of Banicula. Mm, yeah, I love the, that book too. And it's like a red velvet cover. Mm. Um, so I got her a copy of that. Um, I don't know if she has other books she collects, but she'll text me when she hears this. <laughs> she, she, yeah, because I I want to know. I'm gonna put that in your notes too. The book yeah. that your the book that your sister may be collecting. Yeah. And then we came to the end. That is the book about losing your job. And then we came. Oh, okay. Then we came to the end. By Joshua Ferris. Okay. I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look it up on Libby. That's the first place I'm going to look. Yeah. Um, great. It's a great app. Yeah. I'm just so like amazed that like going back to the outsiders that it, it just has so much cultural staying power because like, I'm sure kids reading it now have no idea what greasers and socials are. And I think I had some awareness just because um, in the 70s when I was a child, like the 50s, we're seeing such a huge resurgence. So mm-hmm. it was like exposed to like American Graffiti and sha na and Happy Days. Whereas kids yeah. now are just like, what's Happy Days? What's what's a greaser? You're like, well, in episode two of WandaVision. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess they do kind of get sneak it in there, right? They sneak it in there a little bit, yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if they're still reading it now, but I, I do know that like you can, there's, there's merch that's still on the internet that you can get like mm-hmm. stay gold pony boy. I, but then there were some people that really like were introduced to it late and it was surprising. I was reading, um, uh, there's an, an article, I, th- I think in the New York times or New Yorker from, uh, Lena uh, Dun- Durham, who was like, I didn't learn about this book until I was in college. And you know, it's because someone in one of my classes that I had a crush on told me to stay gold. Mm. Um, but you can, you know, you can buy like, like sweatshirts and t-shirts that have stay gold on them. Yeah. You know, all these online uh, cafe press like stores. And yeah. I think that the coolest thing that I, I discovered about the outsiders is that the house that they filmed uh, in the movie that, that the, the Curtis brothers lived in, it's now um, a museum it's oh. the outsider's house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I know we were talking about uh, about bucket list earlier. And this is actually would be something on my bucket list because I've never been. I, I think I've driven through Oklahoma. It was unremarkable yeah. on the way here to the West Coast. But mm-hmm. I would like to stop. If I ever get back, I'd like to stop and see the outsider's house. You know, and there's just um, a lot of like un- un- not seen pictures photos from the movie from behind the scenes and things like that um what happened was i think it was scheduled for demolition and there was a a, there's a a hip-hop artist named danny boy o'connor and he was a big fan or he is a big fan of the movie and and the novel and he bought the house in 2016 so actually oh recently. recently yeah yeah and uh he was able to save it and now you can I think for ten dollars, go and get a little tour and see all the rooms and see all the photos and stuff like that. And I'm sure there's a gift shop there too, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, and it was, I've got it made some me... friends who have moved to Tulsa in the last couple of years, and it's. I think for like a weekend, I think there's lots to do there. It seems like there's a good food scene. It seems like, yeah, they're having a according to their Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like really enjoying have they moved from chicago to tulsa and they're really enjoying it and there's really kind of a i think because it's so affordable Mm -hmm. there's kind of some either like they're recruiting people they're openly recruiting people to move to oklahoma and move to tulsa to change the to change the uh environment it's not quite the word i want get more people there get more things happening yeah, I I, um, I see that a lot on some of the, like the more of the politics forums. There's always a bunch mm-hmm. of people who are just like, we need to get a bunch of progressive-minded people to move to some of these states and right. try and make a dent. 
And I, you know, I think it's slowly happening just because living in California, it's like just so expensive and so expensive, even any, anywhere on the, in the Pacific Northwest, it's become or the West Coast has become completely unaffordable. But and a lot of people move to Texas, but then they have property taxes and, and laws that are not very, you know, good for people like yeah, women and, I, and queer people and, and people of color. So I think people, well, businesses moved to Texas because they were drawn in by like the no, either it's no sales tax or no income tax. Mm-hmm. So like these, they recruited all these huge companies to move and Plano just became like nothing but corporate campuses. Um, there was an era in my life when I went to Plano all the time for different companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think all those people have finally realized that the politics of Texas is not South by Southwest. Yeah. Right. That they just didn't, couldn't imagine what it was really like there. And at their state, I interviewed James Tallarico for uh, answering the call, which is volunteering I do with military vets who want to run for office. Um, people who have done public service who are trying to decide if if they are, if running for office is their next way to serve the country. And James Tallarico is a state, se- state representative. So he's at the state level outside of Austin and their state legislature meets once every two years hmm. wow. for six weeks because their constitution was written before airplanes. So it was like, oh. you think about how long it would have taken to travel from like the panhandle to Austin to the Capitol and back. And how are you going to ask a farmer or a rancher to do that more than once every two years? And the whole state is governed with these these convening laws developed before airplanes. Mm. And that, to me, that boggles my mind. And it, and it partially explains how they're so capable of gerrymandering and strangling the people of Texas um, because their legislature never meets. Yeah, absolutely. But I do think going to Tulsa to see the Outsider Museum, oh yeah, House Museum I'm, would be really nice. I'm totally. I think you can do that, like you said, in a long weekend. So mm-hmm. and when it maybe gets a little warmer too. But yeah, I was trying to think like, were there any other like literary places or things that I'd want to see like turned into a museum? And it's it's kind of hard. Like I know I want I know that the the, the house in uh, James Joyce's The Dead is mm-hmm. the street it's still it's you know there is a house in dublin that his aunts owned and it was the inspiration you can go see that i don't know if they give tours or whether it's a private home yeah. but so i would definitely do that i wish there was like a house of leaves house but you know how would mm-hmm. that how would that work i don't know but um and i would definitely go to like milwaukee to see like anything laverne and shirley related mm-hmm. but that's i know that's not a book but um that, yeah, that's as far as I got. So I'd love to, yeah. if anyone else has any like suggestions of, from books of gift shops, I would love to, yeah, to hear I'm that because try- this is a, a, my favorite right now. So I just picked up, um, I just picked up a graphic novel biography of Eugene V. Debs. So Eugene V. Debs was a socialist presidential candidate from my hometown in Terre Haute, Indiana. So his house across the street from my elementary school had murals in the attic depicting his life. Mm -hmm. But the house he like, I don't know if it was the house he was born in or the house that he like ran his presidential campaigns from is still in Terre Haute, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, I mean, speech upon speech and pamphlet upon pamphlet. So I think that's a good museum, house museum to visit. Mm. Oh, and of, of course, duh. I, I mean, I'm from Baltimore. So the Edgar Allan Poe house in Baltimore yeah. is one as well. And um, 
There's also an Edgar Allan house in um, Probably Richmond, Philly. Virginia. Oh, is there? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. I do, I do remember that. And there's probably something in Philly, too. Yeah. There's sort of this rivalry, like, who gets to claim him? Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and I do, I mean, I feel like it's cliche, but I wouldn't mind going to Key West to see the polydactyl cats. Of... Oh yeah, I, you should go. I, I well, I did. It was a long time ago in college, yeah. but I did see. I did go to the Ernest Hemingway house. Yeah, back then. Yeah. So. But I don't know. Like, there's not a little house on the prairie house. I don't think. No. Every wardrobe is the lion. Is the possibility of being the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe wardrobe right? Any freestanding mm-hmm. wardrobe, right? You have to check them all. No, I guess there's not a is I I not a, a huge Harry Potter fan as some people, so I don't know if there's a place in London where you where he lived like the suburb that he lived in, or there's not anything like that, right? You can go to the um the platform nine and three quarters in London, mm. so they have it. They've got a photo op set up, and then on September first at twelve o'clock noon every year they do a uh, they put it on the board and they do a train call for the Hogwarts Express on the day when they would have gone to school. Mm, okay. I don't know why I know that, but I do. Well, I'm glad that you do. Yeah. Because now I And there's too. the Christmas Story House in Cleveland. Oh. I didn't um, know that that was that existed too. Yeah. Hmm. And it's essentially it is it's a house in a residential neighborhood. And they've bought a few of the houses nearby, so you can walk through the house where they were they filmed it. And then I think other houses have the gift shop, the gift shops available. And then there's just a ton of signs not to park on the street mm. because it is a residential neighborhood, <laughs> and, the, and the people do want to have their life. Right. Um, and that house I think is for sale. It's on the market. Oh, okay. That museum. Hmm. Yeah, I had a really great book a long time ago that was basically just like um, all the different locations in San Francisco and the Bay Area were like different ce- different scenes from Alfred mm-hmm. Hitchcock movies were um, had taken place. Yeah. And I did remember going up to Bodega Bay for the day. We were out there last and just looking around and seeing where the birds was filmed and... But yeah, so Essie Hinton, she wrote those four novels. She wrote one more for, 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 for YA. It was called Taming the Star Runner in 1988. I was, I'd moved on by then, so never read it. It's not on Libby, so I couldn't read it for this podcast, but yeah. I'm going to definitely try and look it up over spring break and see if I can just find a physical copy somewhere and um, see how it compares to the, the four, the, the Essie Hinton canon, as it were. Yeah, uh, the outsiders. That was then. This is now. Rumblefish and and Tex. Yeah. So, I need I need to ask my sister. That was then. This is now. I'm pretty sure we had. I think we had the outsiders, Rumblefish, and that was then. This is now. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Tex and Taming the Star Runner. I don't think we had those. Yeah, Tex was the last of the four. Um, big ones and that one was published mm-hmm. in 79 and then there was like a nine year uh, interval between Tex and Taming the Star Runner yeah so but Tex actually all of these those four books The Outsiders that was on This Is Now Rumblefish and Tex were all made into films I know we talked mm-hmm. about The Outsiders and Rumblefish but uh, Tex was also a film with Matt Dillon who played a uh, Dally in the Outsiders, mm-hmm. and then that was then. This is now. I I don't think I saw it, and I don't think the it was any of the sort of Brat Pack yeah. guys, as it were. Um, but yeah, I don't think I saw the movie of that. But yeah, if I was, I mean, it, it. She's had a great career. It would be it would be lovely to have four of your novels adapted into movies, and you know, one mm-hmm. of them still being like 
read so widely, you know, and and taught in schools and yeah. So, um, but yeah, she was just a big part of, of my life as a, as a reader and as a writer growing up. And, you know, I, I owe a lot to her, her books and and her perspective and and her just writing a story that she wanted to write that she didn't Mm -hmm. see, you know, I'm sure she was growing up reading things like Gone with the Wind or whatever yeah you know, so there wasn't really a lot of and you know I think she even her her, her name is Susie Hinton and, and the editors obviously wanted her to publish as S.E. Hinton because I, I think that they were worried that um, people wouldn't believe a woman could write a man's perspective right you know? how could she write about teenage boys right even yeah. though she as a teenager her whole life with them right you know? so mm-hmm. um but that helped me, me too, to, to also write in, in both sexes and yeah. genders. And I mean, there's just a lot that I, that I owe to her. She was sort of my gateway drug to, to writing in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, that Have you and, ever... That and, and, and uh, Lu- Louise Spitzhude's Harry at the Spy. Like, I could spend another podcast talking about that book. Oh, it's yeah. one of my favorites. No, that's a real... A real character who is also very complicated and complex mm-hmm. and human and, and terribly unlikable at times and frustrating. But, mm-hmm. And you never saw that sort of character in children's literature before, yeah. you know, before then. And uh, she also uh, did all those lovely illustrations in the book herself. And, you know, she oh, wrote, wow. a, and like, like I see Hinton, she wrote a few other books, but they weren't quite as popular. There was one I think it was The Long Secret that came out a few years later that, that was told from Beth Ellen's kind of point of view. Mm-hmm. It was still omniscient, but it was more about Beth Ellen than it was about Harry. It was more of a minor character yeah. in this book. Um, but yeah, so sort of simil- similarities. And I remember getting, um, last thing I'll say, I remember just getting that from my, my aunt. My aunt went on vacation to like a beach beach town or something it was virginia beach and she uh went into a bookstore because she knew that i liked to read it was like you know 10 or 11 and mm-hmm. she was asking the clerk like what you know what were some good books for a young girl to read and my aunt was like i don't know 22 at the time mm-hmm. and my and this clerk my aunt was explaining to me thought that she was asking for books for herself oh you know? And I'm like that she thought my aunt was like, I don't know, 17, 15. I don't know. Oh, this is kind of how strange. My aunt always looked young. She had that yeah. sort of Ralph Machio sort of mm-hmm. young glow about her. But so the clerk at the store recommended, and this is what my brother and I got, but really me because my brother didn't really care about reading, mm-hmm. even though he was an English major in college. Um, my <laughs> aunt brought home the aforementioned Bonicula, yeah. uh, The Secret Garden, and Harriet the Spy. And that, so I have her to thank for for my introduction to Harriet the Spy and, and the good trio. Secret Garden. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and also those bookstore clerks know what they're talking about, you know, yeah. definitely ask them for suggestions. Yeah. So if you had the opportunity to, um, do a fireside chat with Essie Hinton and you know, she's tired of answering the same old, <laughs> same old questions. Do you have some, questions that you kind of teed up should you ever run into her in an airport or on a stage you know I haven't because I just I I would be a little embarrassed like what do you ask Mm -hmm. you know how do you ask that perfect question yeah you know I'm sure I I guess I would just ask her if she still writes on the side things that she doesn't want people to see Mm -hmm. you know I I, I think as a writer, you just never stop writing. So I can't imagine she's she's stopped, even if she's been reclusive. Um, I think she has like a, she likes horses and has a horse farm or something. Mm-hmm. She still lives in Tulsa. She likes not being a celebrity. She likes being she said a resident. Yeah. So, um, and I get that happens. To, I mean, it, it just happens to a lot of authors are like that. I mean, in Baltimore, we have Ann Tyler. Also very reclusive, but also mm-hmm. just, you know, has written like, what, 10 novels or something about Baltimore. Right. So um, it's just how, I think it's how uh, Hinton and, and Tyler sort of, and, and lots of writers, including myself, just sort of connect with people because it's hard to like, and I'll do it because I, I have no shame mm-hmm. to strike up a conversation with someone in public 
in line you know it just yeah we're just it's not we're not good at that sort of like soft skill of like yeah or like promotion or putting ourselves Mm -hmm. out there um so it's just it's always ironic to me that authors are sort of responsible for so much of their promotion when they're just so bad at it because we just don't like to even yeah talk about it you know it's so the opposite of writing i have benefited from the need of authors to go and do their own promotion because they truly after you came on your publicist reached out and was like that was amazing um can i introduce you to some other authors and she introduced me to a whole bunch of them and so i still have authors coming on to this day because you came on with your last book so it's Mm -hmm. been really fun i've i've learned i've met so many people and i have been able to start reading again and uh, cause really the COVID just wiped it out for me. Oh, I, I understand. Me, me too. Yeah. Like there were a few years when I wasn't reading at all, like less than a book yeah. a month. And I think joining, well, joining a book club helped cause then you felt like you had a deadline and, mm-hmm. and some social you read, pressure. You read that extra chapter every night, even if you didn't want to, but I, it felt like, it felt like just like using a muscle I hadn't used in a long time. Mm-hmm. Once I started reading and find new books I really enjoyed. I, I became hungry again for more and, and having yeah. that experience, an emotional connection. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I've, that you found your way back to it. Yeah, I've been working on, I just finished listening to a Mike Nichols biography. Hmm. Mike Nichols was in Nichols and May with Elaine May, comedy duo of the 1950s. He was the director of The Graduate. He won like seven Tonys for Best Director. He, And it's just, I think within any cultural scene, there's the person who crosses a few boundaries and just seems like they know everyone. And Mike Nichols was active in what, what he was like active in or touching or responsible for so much pop culture theater and movie culture that was created from like 1950 till until his death in 2014 Mm. and it was it was it's he's almost like forrest gump (laughs) because he's after jfk is assassinated he's one of the people that jackie o will be seen on the town with because he's trustworthy and won't make a move and can talk to anyone and will get her like He's just everywhere. And it was fascinating to me because and also just shows how wealth and network and proximity is responsible for what makes it on the big screen. You Mm. know, like, oh, well, we rented this house in the Hamptons next to Leonard Bernstein. And I got to know him swimming with our kids. Like, it's just all this stuff that was it was wild and but engrossing mm-hmm. uh, to listen to. So that's like the big story that I just finished listening to. And then I'm reading um, a book of poetry called Our Cancers by Dan O'Brien. His wife had breast cancer. And then almost as soon as she was in remission, he was diagnosed with, I think, colon cancer. Mm. And their daughter was a toddler. And so I'm sort of, uh, I'm testing the waters with if what I, I I might still be too close to my own experience to be reading cancer stuff right now, but it's really beautiful poetry. Hmm. So. Yeah. Please link that one too. Or both both of those actually. I'd love to take a look. The Company of Strangers is coming out. You said January 10th. Yes. Um, but people can pre-order now, which is very important. Mm-hmm. The pre-order that you can, people could pre-order it now and print it out and give it to somebody for Hanukkah or Christmas and then tell them their book is on the way in January. They could. And I'm actually, I, I bought like a, um, a big pile of vintage postcards, some, you know, just, just off like eBay or something. Cause I, I've always just loved old postcards and collecting them. And, um, for every person that, pre-orders a book I'm sending them a hand-chosen postcard with a a personal message of thanks 
So I, I just get to share my collection of postcards. I love that. Where, how should people tell you they pre-ordered a copy or is your, um, well, if they, um, pre-order from Braddock Avenue books, you know, I, I, I have a, the list of, of the pre-order, pre-orders and the addresses. And then as soon as pre-orders close, I'm going to sit down and look at the list and start working on picking out postcards and, and writing them out to, to the, to people who have ordered. So. Awesome. And where can people keep up with you online? Um, I'm on Twitter still. You know, I, I mm-hmm. joined Hive recently. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to stay there. We still, I think we're all still looking for like the backup mm-hmm. plan that, for Twitter, but it seems to be a little stable, more stable now. So we'll see. And it, it's just, yeah, it's so it, it, it's it's strange to have been on Twitter for so long and, and built up so many. Mm-hmm friends and relationships and then have to start over somewhere else. But I mean, I guess we're all going to, we all might have to do it. And, uh, yeah. but at the same time, part of me is like, well, you know, if, if, if I don't catch on somewhere else, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay too. That'll be a few yeah. more hours of each day that I'll have to do something mm-hmm. else, you know, but, but yeah, thanks Seth, for asking. I'm, I am on Twitter at Mikowski Jen, one word. Right. Um, yeah, this and was your, oh, your literary journal as well, right? Yes, JMWW um, is, and you can just do a search on that JMWW. And we publish um, still we're publishing fiction, nonfiction, flash fiction, poetry, um, interviews. Um, we have a couple of column columns that run each month, and we're, we're basically a weekly journal now. We actually are. Um, we we used to do print anthologies mm-hmm. for a while and then I stopped and we've recently teamed up with another publisher uh, Modern Times Publishing and they are publishing a bunch of um, anthologies of different literary journals on, that have been around and um, earlier this year they approached us and said do you want to be the, the first anthology that we publish and That's I said sure yeah so in 2023 um, we'll be back with a new anthology and it's going to cover like the best of maybe the last 10 years. It's going to be a, a pretty chunky book, but, um, you know, all our editors voted on the last 10 years of submissions and we got all those together and, and, uh, it's in, it's in the proof stages now. So we'll have that come out in 2023. Sort of a big thank you to all of our contributors over the years. Nice. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, Jen, thank you so much for coming back to talk about S.E. Hinton. Thank you for having I'm, me. I always love yeah. talking to you. It's so I fun. always learn so, so much more from you than you probably learned from me, but I just, uh, <laughs> I'm glad for the opportunity. You're so well, you're so well-rounded and versed in so many things. Or I appreciate, I, I will take that framing. <laughs> <laughs> I am like a, a sieve or a flypaper for trivia. I'm really good on trivia teams. Good. I'm going to remember that when I pull out my yeah. trivial pursuit and I, yes, going to have to zoom you in as my partner. Oh, I used to keep a backup copy copy of Trivial Pursuit in my car. Wow. When I lived in Colorado, in case I went to a party and it wasn't fun enough, I'd be like, hey, guys, I have a solution. Oh, that's that's pretty intense. This was in like 2001, 1999 to 2001. I would go to my car and get my copy of Trivial Pursuit, just, you know, in case we weren't having much fun. Now, did it, did it liven it up? Because I have to say, I had a similar, like, <laughs> impulse in college, but it was usually I was really drunk, and I was like, let's play Pink Floyd. And that was, right. like, that was like a party killer, always. Yeah. Um, but did, would this have the opposite effect? Everyone's like, all right, three hours of intense trivia. Sometimes they would let me... <laughs> sometimes we would play was careful and sometimes wording there. it was yeah. just it was just a bit but I literally kept a copy of one of my copies of Trivial Pursuit in my car that, that's, that that's was real still, fun that's, yeah that's ballsy and awesome <laughs> I love it yeah. awesome well thank you so much well thank you Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.